Well, good afternoon and uh, welcome to the second session in our swine dairy uh, topics at the uh, university today. Uh, today, this uh, topic is going to be in manure management. Uh, kind of just our agenda for today, uh, I'm going to go through some of the dairy pressure points that we see in manure management as well as the swine manure pressure points and then I'm going to hand uh, the microphone over uh, to my colleague and he's going to go through determining value, preserving value, um, manure as a resource and then some take home points for you folks. So two speakers tag te teaming today. My name's Dr. Reed Lighting. I'm a veterinarian from Worthington, Minnesota. Uh, I'm primarily a pig person, uh, but because we're a mixed practice and uh, uh, we work across all species. And, uh, and then Dr. Ben Luxick, we'll let him introduce himself uh, later, but also from the Worthington practice area. I think uh, as an industry we recognize today that uh, manure is not a waste product uh, anymore. It used to be uh, considered a waste product, but certainly a natural fertilizer and uh, a product that has a, is a valuable resource for our farms. Uh, stewardship. Uh, we individually uh, want to be about uh, land and resource stewardship. That's who we need to be as an industry of livestock people. Um, we, we need to lead the way in stewardship. If we don't lead the way, uh, there's generally a uh, governmental agency that'll help lead the way. Um, so we, we want to be the folks that are, that are driving that uh, system. We'll talk about uh, a couple of the pressure points that we see within uh, dairy uh, manure management. Certainly application and storage are big parts of how we handle manure, uh, what we do with it between seasons and then how we get it onto uh, the land. Uh, neither of us are agronomists and don't pretend to be. Uh, and there's uh, clearly a scientific portion of what needs to be determined through uh, the agronomy sector. Uh, two nutrients in particular on the dairy side that we deal with is phosphorus and copper, and we'll address both of those today. Uh, dairy system diversity, I think we recognize uh, one of the concerns about a talk like this is because our dairy industries uh, are about this focused when we look across the entire dairy industry. We have pasture systems, dry lot housing. Uh, when this white haired guy started in practice, uh, mostly gutter barns uh, where they hauled out manure daily to the field. Uh, we see scraper systems today, flush systems, uh, slatted flooring, bedded packs and uh, some farms a combination of many of these. So we have multiple kinds of manure management occurring on the same farm at the same time. And then how we store manure uh, is the other uh, uh, concern as we look at uh, what happens to manure from the time it's produced until the time it gets applied to the field and what are the potentials for runoff uh, into the environment. Uh, certainly deep pits and slurry tanks uh, are not uncommon. Uh, we see lagoons uh, for storage and waste management that might be recycled water, it might be fresh water or a combination thereof depending on where it is on the farm. Uh, we see manure packs uh, used on farms. Solid storage uh, where we have manure stockpiled in crop season and held to the end of the season. Uh, composting, uh, methane, um, I'm not an expert on it, but I know as an industry, um, we're continuing to see more and more methane and biogas uh, being used in the industry. Uh, and then we have some farms that have solid separators also. So the biggest concern, as I said, with pre-application is storage. Uh, how do we handle manure for a period of time so that we don't have runoff or leakage from uh, the facilities? And pre-application, that's really our biggest concern. Uh, we have multiple types of application uh, within the dairy industry. Uh, the broadcast spreaders still commonly use uh, surface application tanks. Uh, we inject some. Uh, we have some irrigation systems uh, where we're, we're taking summer lagoon water uh, off the top and actually irrigating crops with that. Stewardship goes beyond application. Uh, I think we rarely uh, consider uh, when we're uh, feeding cows or feeding pigs uh, what we're doing to the manure until we get to the end. But certainly how we, what we, we are what we eat uh, and we're certainly uh, a part of producing uh, the manure uh, within our systems is affected by uh, what the ingredients are. 
And uh, uh, we need to maybe think about some of these things uh, before or as we're feeding and what, what happens as, as that product gets into uh, our systems. Uh, we do affect the makeup of manure by what we do. Um, how we've spread manure in the past affects what we've done and uh, where we're going. Uh, how, how we feed the cows currently matters. And then uh, what we dump into the manure or what ends up in the manure, it's not always only manure, there's some wastewater, there's uh, some uh, uh, foot baths, uh, things that end up in the manure that make part of our overall uh, manure product. Uh, phosphorus is one of our biggest concerns in dairy and it's often the limiting uh, nutrient that we use to place on the soil. So we're placing uh, manure to a phosphorus maximum in many cases and um, and it was probably a lot more common when I started in veterinary practice that if you did soil sampling, you'd see that uh, the, f the soil close to the farm had super high phosphorus levels. And as you got farther from the farm place, it got lighter. And uh, we've gotten better at that. That was because uh, when it was too snowy, it got dumped close to the yard. When it was too muddy, it got close dumped to the yard. When we had to go to the dance recital, it got cl dumped close to the yard. So there's a lot of reasons that it stayed close to home, but I think as an industry, we've gotten much better at recognizing the resource as fertilizer values have went up and then actually applying it in a way that matters. Uh, we some, see some of that, but it's not nearly to the degree that we did. Um, copper, in particular, uh, has a strong affinity in the soil and organic matter, so it sticks, it stays, and it's in the soluble form. So uh, forages that are taken from uh, copper-rich soils are going to be higher in uh, copper, and it affects how we feed cows. Uh, if we look at copper in particular, um, we see that uh, it's not... Kind of the NRC National Research Council is kind of the standardized uh, number that's used. Somewhere between 12 and 15 parts per million of copper is what a dry or lactating cow needs. We see uh, spec diets that are anywhere from 8 to 28 and sometimes higher. So probably getting on, potentially getting on the higher side of uh, what needs to be formulated in diets. It's not uncommon for us to add a little bit more uh, because we don't want to miss out on something. Uh, we also know that copper is in the water, and it's part of the, uh, what becomes uh, manure and what's placed in the cow. And then we fake, take feedstuffs from these areas that are, that are rich in copper, so we end up with high copper feedstuffs. Uh, if we're just using book values and we're not actually uh, testing feedstuffs, in, in particular copper, it's not uncommon to end up with a diet that's higher than copper than maybe it should be, some water source, and then some feedstuffs that are higher than what we spec into the diet. And they all have an effect on uh, what, what comes out of the cow, goes onto the land, and then comes back into the forage. So it is a big cycle, and we do need to pay attention to that. Uh, we also see a, a fair amount of copper toxicity in calves. So copper is one of those that we want to watch. Uh, we see that in calves coming out of uh, bottle calves, that kind of thing, coming out of Pennsylvania, Michigan, into our area where uh, we're doing liver biopsies and uh, seeing quite high levels of copper uh, coming, coming with those calves. Um, copper from foot baths is another source of copper on our farms. A uh, thousand cow dairy that uses a foot bath three times uh, a week uh, at a 5% rate uh, puts about two tons of copper back into uh, the manure that comes back under the soil. So just thinking about the total cycle for phosphorus and copper uh, as we uh, just get manure out into the field uh, is important. Swine's very similar. Uh, swine... Uh, the points that we're going to talk about are the composition of the manure. It's quite different depending on the stage of production. Uh, phosphorus and copper are, are concerns for us, just like they were in dairy. And then zinc, because of some of the uh, nursery practices that are done, is also a, uh, a metal product that we need to watch in manure. Uh, feed composition uh, is a big part of it. So how we spec diets, much like we saw in the dairy, is important to... Uh, what ends up actually in the manure of the pig. Uh, seasonal consumption differences in water makes, makes our manure change by season. Uh, whether we're in a bedded facility, uh, in barn delivery, or we're using bowls or nipples. Uh, in the case of pigs, 
uh, how do we store the manure? Is it deep pits? Is it lagoons where a lot of the uh, uh, ammonia is blown off? Uh, it changes how we handle manure. And then normal microbial comp uh, decomposition as well as pit additives that enhance microbial uh, uh, breakdown of the manure and change the nutrient profile of the manure. Uh, getting good samples uh, is in, uh, incredibly important when we uh, test the manure. It's really hard in, in uh, solid storage systems to get an accurate, uh, consistent sample. Um, so we have to work really hard at that and probably grind some product to get that done. Uh, liquid samples, certainly only after agitation. Uh, many of the pits that we have are uh, full year uh, pits, so we need to agitate those before we get a good uh, sample of manure for testing. And we can't just say it's probably like last year because feeding programs make a big difference on what the manure is like this year. Uh, we are what we eat. Uh, we also know that there's tremendous difference in the quality of the manure. If we look at uh, manure quality, if that's the right term, uh, nursery units have a lot of water, uh, not very much from a nutrient standpoint. So we have to put a lot of uh, tonnage onto an acre, gallons per acre. Uh, sow units are kind of the next uh, poor, next better uh, manure quality. Uh, finishers, uh, certainly uh, heavy, heavy protein, heavy uh, phosphorus diets fed to finishers are probably the best. It makes a big difference whether we have nipples or cup waters with the amount of wastage, uh, and especially season seasonally. It's not uncommon the first year that someone puts bowls into their finishers if they're used to nipples. In an eight foot pit, they'll save probably 18 inches of fill uh, and that was all wastewater. Um, so it changes the composition uh, quite a bit. And then the wean to finish barns, as we lease wean to finish barns, we know that that manure is not gonna have the quality uh, that straight finishing barn manure has because the nursery is such a poor uh, time to uh, create nutrients in the manure. Well, the three uh, nutrients that we are concerned with are phosphorus, copper, and zinc. Uh, co cop or phosphorus, just, just like in the dairy side, um, it's, it's probably the most limiting nutrient that we deal with in, in swine. So we'll place manure onto land up to the point that we can't put on more phosphorus. We're sh still short of nitrogen from a corn uh, growing capacity, but that's kind of our limiting one. So we've worked as an industry to change that over the years. Uh, we try to reduce the amount of phosphorus in the, mo in the manure in relation to uh, the uh, amount of nitrogen primarily. Phytase, phytase is commonly used. It's an enzyme that's used in the uh, swine industry as well as other industries. Uh, most of the phosphorus that's in uh, forages, grains, are, is in the bound phytate form. So the pig, simple stomach animal, can't use that. So phytase is used to break that phytate bond and make the uh, phosphorus available to the pig. And in doing that, we don't have to use as much uh, inorganic phosphorus in the diet that ends up passing on through the pig into the manure. Um, and uh, with phytase, there actually is, uh, sometimes we're adding things to get a better response, but it, with the uh, phytase, there's actually a cost savings to adding phytase to the diet. Um, I put on here 80 cents a ton to add phytase at that 450 uh, phytase forming units in the, in the diet. Uh, we could probably do it in the mid 50 cent range within a VTM with some of the concentrated forms. But what it allows us to do is drive out uh, 14 pounds of monocal in the diet at 50 cents a pound a day. Current price, that's about $7 a ton, so a net $6 a ton savings. Uh, every three pigs eat a ton of finishing feed, so a $6 savings is $2 for pig, per pig. If you're in the swine industry, you know we do almost anything for $2 a pig, uh, so it's a huge savings for us. Um, kind of a busy slide, but I just showed, this is three different finishing diets. These diets to the pig are the same. Uh, a 1.18 digestible lysine diet, these are all 1.18 digestible lysine diets. And if you see the bottom row, these are all 0.31 uh, available phosphorus. So the, to the pig, it's the exact same uh, lysine level, it's the exact same phosphorus level. We would expect these pigs to respond the same. But if you get in the middle there and you look at monocow, basically what we've done with these three diets, a traditional corn soy diet, followed by a corn soy diet just by adding phytase, 
and then a corn soy diet with phytase and dried distiller's grains. Uh, when we add phytase and dried distiller's grains, we take that 23 pounds of monocal and drive it entirely out of the diet. Uh, the phosphorus in, in DDGs is much more available and we're using phytase. And what that does, you can see there's an $18 a ton difference between corn soy and phytase uh, DDG type diets. $18 a ton, $6 a pig. Uh, we would do that all day long. So how we form diets, that's why we can't just use last year's samples because how we form diets this year changes the composition of the manure for, for uh, the coming year. Copper is one of those that we deal with in pigs. Uh, five to six parts per million is, is the NRC requirement for pigs. Uh, very common to feed 250 parts per million of copper in the nursery and early finishing stages for E. coli control. Um, easy to put in, relatively cheap, and you can see what that does to the phosphorus uh, content of the manure when we feed that much. Zinc is the other issue that we deal with uh, in nursery diets. Uh, it's not uncommon to feed 2,000 to 3,000 parts per million or higher of zinc oxide, again, aimed at E. coli control in young piglet diets. Um, the pig only needs 80 to 115 parts per million, and uh, the rest is just for E. coli control. You can see uh, European Union. Uh, it's a big enough environmental issue that the European Union has banned any usage of zinc, total zinc in the diet, over 150 parts per million. So this would be what's in the forage and feedstuffs plus what you've added. So not much more than that 80 to 115 uh, parts per million. Now, we're not in the business of custom making manure, but understanding what we're doing to, uh, to understand what's gonna come out of the pig is important. Uh, we know some of these environmental pressure points that we, that we deal with as an industry and to be ahead of them I think is, is pretty important. And luckily, the, uh, some of these changes we make like phytase and adding of DDGs is good for the environment, neutral for the pig, and good for the cost of the pig. So we certainly want to be about those kinds of things. Now I'll pass it on to Dr. Luxick. Thank you, Dr. Lighting. Um, so does, ma does manure make sense for your farm? Um, so how we kind of think about this is when fertilizer prices are good, you know, you, that's what you buy. Um, you purchase fertilizer as needed. Um, you might apply manure as convenient. Um, but only, tw only about 20% of the producers out there right now are actually spreading manure or testing manure. Um, so we'll, we'll talk about that a little more. Um, but when fertilizer prices are poor, that's really where manure is uh, to your advantage from, from an economic standpoint. Um, you only want to be purchasing fertilizer when you absolutely need it. Um, and... Uh, soil and manure testing is even more beneficial. Um, so <clears throat> manure kind of has some intrinsic value. It's determined by the nutrients that are in it, as Dr. Lighting alluded to. So uh, that's your nitrogen, your phosphorus, and your, and your potassium are the, the three big macronutrients. Um, and and the value of, of the equivalent nutrients in what you would be buying in fertilizer is kind of how we think about uh, manure because manure offsets the amount you would need to buy. Um, less the cost of hauling and spreading, um, which includes labor. Um, and then um, the realization of the maximum value from manure relies upon um, both soil and manure testing so you can match the nutrients that are in the manure with what your fields actually need. Um, and this was a, a study or a simulation done by Iowa State um, that basically shows uh, in, in virtually every scenario it is cost beneficial to test your manure. Um, and so the fact that 
that only 20% of the producers out there are actually doing it suggests that um, maybe, um, maybe the value of manure testing is not understood. But um, from this graph, we see that even a 20% reduction in nitrogen uncertainty um, in your manure, which we might, we might think of as being a pretty poor test, um, it's, still, um, it's still valuable um, from, from an economic standpoint to test that. So um, the value is higher when you sample manure during application because you know exactly what you're spreading. Um, the value is a little bit less when you sample prior to spreading because um, since there's a little bit of a lag time there from when you sample to when you spread, um, other factors are in play that could alter the nutrient profile of, of, uh, of, of that fertilizer. Um, but virtually in every case, it's, it's, uh, it's cost beneficial to test. Um, and to get the maximum value from, from your manure as fertilizer, um, you really want to match the supply with the demand, right? So you want to pair your soil tests with your manure tests. Um, and that's, that's really what's going to help you allocate what you have most optimally. If you have a surplus, great. Uh, but, but if you have a limited supply, that's, that's really where you want to be more strategic about which field you spread it on. Um, and so expertise is certainly warranted for that. Um, again, we're not agronomists and we don't pretend to be, so um, we definitely recommend um, consulting an agronomist um, to help you do that. Um, and the manure nutrients are, again, where the value is. So that's affected by feed composition, um, what the animals are being fed. Um, it's affected by weather conditions, temperature and humidity. Um, nitrates leach from manure more readily in warmer temperatures than they do in colder temperatures. Um, animal species uh, is a huge factor. Um, so poultry manure or swine manure is uh, generally much higher in nitrogen than, um, than bovine manure. Um, and then how you store that, how you store that manure um, based on your livestock facilities um, and the amount of water that gets mixed with that manure is going to change the concentration, the concentration of nutrients within that, that fertilizer package. Um, and uh, manure kind of degrades uh, in nutrients over time. Um, uh, so the age of manure matters, uh, as well as the application method. Um, and this is kind of an interesting slide just to show you the equivalence of what 50, 50 pounds of nitrogen fertilizer um, can do for you. So, so uh, the, you know, that would be equivalent to one and a half to three tons per acre of poultry manure, 20 to 30 tons per acre of beef, and about 100 tons per acre of horse manure. So clearly species matters here. Um, and the, de the detractors of manure value um, are anything that would affect the nitrogen content or the nitrogen availability um, within that, that uh, manure. So uh, anything that dilutes those nutrients, um, your, your moisture content, um, anything that would uh, chemically degrade those nutrients, the leaching of nutrients through the soil um, so that it's no longer readily available for the plant. Um, uh, and then since we have to spread the manure, uh, higher labor costs um, and the inability to adapt to new regulations would also be detractors of manure value because if you can't spread it, you can't, you can't derive value from it. Um, and what I have left on there, on, on the, the left hand side of that slide is, uh, uh, that's a nitrate molecule and that's just to show you that it has a negative charge and that negative charge is what allows it to be water soluble and leach through the soil readily. So 
whatever we can do to preserve that value in the manure and prevent that from happening is is uh, going to maximize the benefit you you can gain from it. Um, and so, fresh manure is generally higher in nutrients than than old manure. Um, again, applying at colder temperatures, um, minimizing the distance to haul, right? Because the longer you haul, the more labor and equipment costs you have. Um, and so lower labor costs, lower equipment costs, uh, lower maintenance costs um, are all going to um, increase the amount you can feasibly spread. Um, so there's kind of two, two general strategies usually um, with manure application. Usually you apply at either the nitrogen rate, le so less than or equal to uh, the nitrogen requirements of the current crop you're planting or the crop for the, um, uh, the following, uh, following tillage. So, um, or you can apply less than or equal to the, the phosphorus requirements. And some of this will be dictated depending on which uh, region you live in. Um, different regions have different regulations, but um, the problem with applying at the nitrogen rate is um, you tend to over apply other nutrients that, that the soil doesn't need. So your phosphorus, your potassium, the sulfur, the zinc, as, as Dr. Lighting alluded to, uh, all of those are, um, are going to be more than what your field needs. Um, Whereas if you're applying at the phosphorus rate, um, usually you have to buy nitrogen fertilizer to, to make up the difference there because phosphorus uh, is higher in manure than, um, than nitrogen is for, for uh, a given volume. Um, so um, this is uh, another study done by Iowa State that shows the benefit of the timing of when you spread. So um, EFM on the, the left graph is your early fall manure, LFM is your late fall manure, and then you have your spring manure. And you can see that the, the crop yields are highest um, the, later, um, the later you spread, or earlier in the year you spread, so when the temperatures are warmer. Um, and the, the graph on the right kind of shows the same thing. Spring manure, um, uh, leads to higher crop yields than, um, than spreading in the fall when temperatures are cold. Um, and the availability, availability of nitrogen decreases uh, the longer you wait to incorporate that manure into the soil. So if you're direct injecting, availability is very high. If you broadcast it and wait a few days before you um, work it into the soil, then you're, you're not going to get as much benefit from it. Um, and this is uh, some work done by the University of Minnesota. Um, it shows the nitrogen availability by year. So your, your beef uh, Y1 is, is the availability of beef manure nitrogen in year one. Y2 would be that same availability in year two and so on for, for all the other species. And what you see here um, uh, on the, the y-axis is uh, the different, different methods of uh, applying manure. And uh, again, generally uh, manure that's incorporated within 12 hours has the highest availability and that's regardless of, of which species you um, are applying manure that's incorporated uh, later than 12 hours, um, you see a pretty rapid taper of that availability. And, um, and uh, the other takeaway here is that uh, swine, uh, swine and poultry manure is generally higher in nitrogen availability than beef or dairy manure. Um, and um, this, this just shows uh, how much the 
um, the moisture content of manure varies um, by species as it as it comes out of the animal. So that's that's going to affect nitrogen um, um, availability as well. Um, and this this kind of shows uh, a similar theme. So again, poultry and swine are higher than than the bovine species. But even within a species, a big takeaway from this graph is just the amount of variability you have. Um, and so that's why testing is so important because um, if you can get if you can hone in on on a specific number, that's going to do a lot more for you. Um, in terms of strategic application than just using an average. Um, and so this is kind of an example calculation of how you might walk through um, uh, estimating the, the value of a, a manure sample on, on your farm. So um, the first row of cells there is just the fertilizer cost of the corresponding nutrients um, that we have in our, our manure test sample, uh, which is on line three there. Um, and then line four is just the, the percent of those nutrients that is actually available to the plants. So that's, that's uh, largely dependent on which method of application you're using. And, and there are published values for that um, on various extension websites that are uh, a very quick and easy uh, look up. But basically you want to determine what percentage of the nutrients in your manure test are actually available. Um, and then uh, based on a soil test, you want to determine how uh, many nutrients you need to spread on that field. And so then whether you're applying at the nitrogen rate or the phosphorus rate, um, that's going to depend on how, how much you apply and how much you need to supplement um, or, or purchase fertilizer for. And so that's kind of how we, uh, we arrive at our uh, $113 um, per thousand gallons in this example as a first year fertilizer value of manure. So I just took the, the fertilizer cost up top, uh, multiplied by um, the nutrients um, with value um, number down at the bottom to, to get the, the piecewise um, component uh, value of, of each nutrient and then just sum those together to get the 113. So that's, that's how you might think about um, determining the, um, the value for one sample. Um, these are a number of calculators you can use on uh, different extension websites. Um, all of the spreadsheets are set up a little bit differently. Um, I like to say all models are wrong, but all models uh, offer some value. And so um, there are different assumptions that go into each one. So finding out which one works for your farm uh, is, is kind of going to be up to you. And, and maybe uh, will involve some experimentation and uh, you know consulting an agronomist, working with uh, the soil tester you use. But um, there are resources available out there. So the costs of manure application are really going to be your your sampling costs, your lab fees, and your hauling and spreading costs, which of course includes labor. Um, so. Um, just as an example, consider a farrow to finish swine operation producing 1,500 head a year. Um, each pig produces about 300 gallons of manure a year, um, which works out to 450,000 gallons in a year's time for the whole operation. Um, and suppose, uh, based on current market prices, that we determine um, based off the, the last example calculation that this, this manure has a fertilizer value of about 5,400 bucks. So should we haul it? Um, this is an example from Iowa State that kind of uh, breaks down um, different, uh, it, it breaks down the problem into variable costs and total costs. And so if we look 
in this example at the $5,400 value of manure. Um, based on the total cost of spreading that manure, um, we can only feasibly haul that manure about one mile uh, to, get, to derive value from it. But if we look at the variable cost of manure and ignore our fixed costs, now we can spread it a lot further, uh, four miles plus, and uh, we may not be covering all of our fixed costs, but we may be covering some of those fixed costs. So um, this, this graph kind of just shows uh, everything in the last slide just in a different way. So for people who are more visual, the $5,400 flat line is, is our manure value. The green line is our variable costs, and the blue line is our total costs. And you, you'll see as we move further out on the x-axis, the more, the more distance we haul, um, yeah, we're not covering our total cost, but we're covering our, our variable cost. And um, this is uh, kind of the last graph that drives that point home. But we can think of manure as a check on your desk. It's, it's value that's waiting to be used, and if you don't use it, it's going to deteriorate. Um, but so it, I'm kind of def, I'm defining that check as the revenue in this example, revenue minus variable cost. And in business terms, we would call that the contribution margin. Um, but basically, the value of your manure, the 5,400 bucks minus uh, your variable cost for each distance you haul, um, that's going to be the green line there. So the green line is the value of your manure after variable costs are covered. Um, and the blue line is your, your total, or I'm sorry, your fixed costs. And so what this, what this graph shows is that even, even though, um, say at a, a quarter or a half a mile, um, you're, you're definitely in the clear. Your total cost is covered. Um, you're making money by spreading manure. Once you go out to four or five miles, you're no longer covering that blue line. You're, you're not covering your fixed costs, but you're putting some portion towards that to cover it. And so you're not truly losing money until you're out in the, the Christmas colors there, six, six, seven miles. And so uh, the, the big takeaway here is to always break this down into your, what are your fixed costs? What are your variable costs? And how do I think about um, mitigating those? Um, so manure offsets the cost of purchased fertilizer. And um, the takeaways we have for you guys are uh, that managing manure is increasingly about being a good steward. Uh, some nutrients are undesirable and we have to manage the, um, the amount of uh, pollution into the environment um, uh, by reassessing how we spread, how we manage manure. Um, species has a big effect on how we do that and uh, testing is a very useful way to quantify uh, what nutrients are in the fertilizer that's uh, supplied to us through the animals. Um, and the, the preservation of manure value and, and the, more, the more we can minimize uh, the leaching of those nutrients is gonna help you maximize that value uh, in the manure. And when paired with a soil test, um, uh, that's going to help you allocate those nutrients more strategically. Again, consult an agronomist. Um, and the feasible distance to haul increases as manure nutrients increase and the soil test values decrease. So um, hauled manure that covers even a, a portion of your fixed costs is money well spent. Um, and with that, I... Hope you guys got something out of this talk and we're happy to take any questions. I have a cattle feedlot next door to me and uh, uh, it's basically free of cost, but it's loaded with pigweed seed. 
um, any way to, you know, to kill a germination? That's an excellent question. I don't, I don't know of a way to uh, sterilize that product. Anybody else in the room have any uh, experience with that? Or Ben? No? I don't, no. Yeah. Uh, Great question. It's one of our issues with natural fertilizer, yeah. I got a question. Well, a more of a comment. You guys did a good job presentation, but we're in Ohio, you know, I know out and where you guys are at, there's miles and miles of acres and the rate that they had on there is not even realistic. You know, manure is a nuisance and all, and if I was, I mean, any grain farmer sitting in here that thinking about getting manure, if you got a hog farmer that's got six, seven, eight, ten finishing barns or farrow to finishing barns, there's not enough acres that he's got them on to take that manure away. Same with all these guys growing chickens that got three or four big broiler houses or four broiler, you know, they say, oh, that manure's worth a lot. You gotta truck it, you gotta haul it, you gotta spread it, you gotta reload it, you know. It, they should be, there should, I mean, those guys think it's worth this, they go and test it. They go out in a barn and get a cup of this out of a barn that's 600 feet long and say, oh, this, this chicken manure's got 60 pounds of nitrogen in it. Where at? Underneath the water line, underneath the feed line? You know, you get over there in that sawdust. I mean, there's no value to that. Just like a hog barn. I mean, we've hauled plenty of hog barns. Well, how do you... I pumped water, four feet of water off a hog barn after even agitating it before you get to the good stuff. How do you value that, you know? And, you know, 50 bucks an hour ain't nobody hauling hog manure for $50 an hour, especially a quarter mile. I mean, guys are our way getting $150 an hour. You know, you got to figure it per gallon, per nitrogen value. I mean, this guy here with getting the feedlot manure, you know, his, his, I know he's getting it for free, but, yeah, now he's got weeds out the Yazoo probably. And, you know, the best thing I can only think of is let it go through a heat, stockpile it for two years, compost it. That would be about the only thing you could do. But, you know, these big operations, they want you to grow as many hogs as you can and feed as many chickens and all these big dairy farmers, you know, I've seen several dairy farms that went out of business that got 8, 10, 15 million gallon lagoons full and they just walk away from walk like, away. you know, hey, yep. it ain't our problem, we're out of business, you know. Yep. You know, this is, it's a nuisance. I mean, I'm a dairy, my dad's a dairy farmer. He's gotten in trouble for running manure in the creek and doing all that kind of stuff. It's, it's a tough business, but, you know, you guys are like, well, just haul it to your fields, you need it. Well, your fields you need it are 10 miles in the opposite direction of where your barn is and you can't afford to haul it there. You yeah, know. it's it's pretty regional, regional and yeah, and I mean, specific by yeah. by uh, I mean, producer. I mean, we we have a lot of producers up where we're at that are. I mean, their their barns aren't all clustered together. They're grain producers yeah. that have built barns uh, for the manure. They don't even run the barns, which thankfully on the pig side, our grain people aren't running our barns because uh, yeah. that's a disaster. But but I think it can be done well. But it's certainly not always done well <clears throat> for sure. No, I think like. Like I said, where you guys are at, there's a lot of area, Iowa, there's more area to cover manure with. You can drag line it, pump yep. it a lot cheaper farther down the road. But you get in areas where guys are trying to make a living farm and they're like, well, I'm going to put up a hog barn or chicken barn or something like that. I got all this fertilizer. It's like, that's true, but, you know, it's nothing is free and nothing is as cheap as everyone thinks it is, you know. Yep. It's not simple math, No, for sure. it's like you got to really put a pencil to manure in general and, I think some of these guys that got 10 acres in a chicken barn or a hog barn, you know, yeah. you really got to be giving that stuff away. You're, you're you know, trying or, to get rid of it. Because yep. I know a guy, he, he's down in an area where there's not much farm, and he put one up on top of a cliff, and it's like he has to pay guys to take it. And it's like, well, Correct. how much you making now, you know? So yep. that's it's a not, food not for thought math, for everybody for sure. on hog manure or anything else. Thanks. Yeah, great input. Uh, my question is, uh, like, I'm actually in the middle of three hog barns, and th my concern is, like, what, what about, uh, like, what's the detrimental effect? Like, I mean, the lagoons are anaerobic. I think the biology that you're putting on is really, really bad. Uh, actually, like, taking out our, um, our natural good organisms in the soil. Mm -hmm. We're watching a, de a decline in those, but then is it related to, like, detergents that they're using in these barns? Or, like, what did, like, is there any comment on that? Like, what? they're actually scrubbing these barns with and whatever, because I mean, they, they're moving animals in, like, I mean, there's truckloads going out every week. And then, you know, they go, they take 
take that paddock, they wash it, so they're washing with detergents all the time. Like, is there, like, as a farmer, is there kind of a list of, like, hey, if these guys are using this detergent, we shouldn't be putting this on our land because we're, we're burning it out and causing other problems? Or because actually some of our really, really heavy land that gets lots and lots of manure, like, it's going backwards. Okay, so as I understand the question, um, basically as, as we, you know, look at, I think you had said swine facilities in particular. Yeah, finishing um, barns. Yep, I see what Dr. Nagorski said about the lights deafening you. So if I make sure I get this right. Um, so, uh, so swine manure going back onto the land, what detrimental effects does it have in, re in regards to uh, probably um, just the normal biosphere of the soil? Uh, because of what's being done in the barn that ends up in the pit that ends up on the land. Is that? Yeah. Okay, question, yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, obviously there's tremendous variation in, in what's occurring uh, in these barns, and probably the most common thing that we see uh, is the use of disinfectants. Now, most of our disinfectants, um, although they work on clean, dry surfaces, uh, once they come into contact with uh, organic matter, they don't do very much. Um, I don't cl claim to be a manure expert, but um, uh, I think, you know, overall nutrient availability is uh, probably a bigger uh, issue in how we place uh, manure onto fields, whether we overapply that kind of thing than, than actual uh, chemicals, things that maybe get into the, into the pit that end up on the land that changes it. Uh, but probably a good agronomist question. So I guess would, uh, just to follow up with that, would you be better off to do more smaller applications, like more frequent, because what we're doing now, it's like 10,000 gallons an acre every three years. And like it's okay for that first crop, second crop kind of stuff, the third one's better. Uh, like is it just, it's just almost physically too hot and you can't convince these guys to put it on at a lower rate because they're like, well, it costs us 200 bucks an acre to put you it on. Drive and, over and, more acres. and you're only paying 45, yep. <laughs> you know, to get it done. Like they're, they're operating at a loss. Yep. Is that finishing manure, nursery manure? That's, manure? that's finishing barns. Yeah. Nursery barns? No, finishing. Finishing. Yeah. yeah, that, that would be a pretty high application. That'd be a super high application for finishing barns in our area. We may see some nurseries that are in that 7,000 range, uh, but that's got to do with water. Uh, availability or water uh, in that manure. So that would seem like an awfully high delivery rate, but you're right, they don't want to cover any more acres than they have to, so then delivery rates are, are bumped up. But um, that doesn't sound like maybe that's the right uh, ratio for the crop. No, it's definitely not. <laughs> yep. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. well, I guess that's my question is like, what's like, what's a good alternative? Like, I'm, it's not that we want to be a poor neighbor or anything and like not take it or whatever like we want to use it but at the same time like not at our not at our expense you know yep i mean in in our area i would say upper midwest most of our, our swine manure is probably going to be spread to a phosphorus maximum so but but not um over applying from a phosphorus standpoint that would be our, our limiter in our area and then we'd have to give nitrogen or something alongside. But does like anybody else in the crowd just have any yeah. com comment on that? Like with like actual like land burnout on really, really heavy, heavily fertilized uh, manure fields? We do it, we do five, 6,000 every year. And we're corn on corn. Corn on corn. But it's, it's applied by, we have to file a manure management plan and we're only allowed by the amount of yield to apply what we can. Um, what they get, I'm in Saskatchewan, Canada. Uh, <laughs> pretty much do it. Pretty much do it every one. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's pretty much spoiled. Yeah. Five minutes.
Uh, I, I just have a quick question. Uh, we haul our own swine manure, finishers and nurseries, and my just question would be, what's the best way to get the best sample out of that pit? Because you could take, I don't know, could you take 10 different samples that could be drastically different? Or what's the best way or most feasible way to get your sample, I guess, is my question. Yeah, so what's the best way to get an agitated sample that's consistent uh, for what's being hauled out? You can take multiple samples and they look different, and that's, that's exactly right. So, I mean, it, where, it's, where it's coming from in the barn is, is a part of that, and then how well we can actually get it agitated. Um, I would say we're probably a little bit away from an exact science, clearly, um, uh, when it comes to uh, agitation. How long do you have to agitate before uh, you're done agitating and can take a sample? And at what point are you trying to get manure out of the barn? Uh, while you're agitating, while you're trying to get a sample and get it on the field at the same time. So, you know, I, I think, you know, obviously the longer we agitate, probably the better uh, sample that we get, but there's going to be some inconsistencies. And many times, you know, I'm talking about taking samples this year because you can't rely on last year, but we do some blending of uh, last year's samples and this year's samples to come up with some averages and then watch those trends over time. So um, it's, it's a difficult process. So I have a local co-op that uh, takes some samples sometimes and they have like a long PVC pipe so they get a profile from the manure. Would that sample be worth anything? I, I, think, it's, I think it's helpful but I mean we see tremendous variation in the pit as you move around the barn. Below feeders is different than uh, below waters and we see the feed mounds and so where you take that is even sub subject to uh, some, a lot of variability. Hey, uh, maybe we can take this outside. We've got to set up the room for the next talk but these are some great questions. I'm sure you guys could answer them off stage. Come find us if you got a question yet. That's great. <laughs>